Hi, Christina. Hi, Bob. How are you? Quite well. How about you? Uh, I wouldn't go so far as quite well. I would say well. I'm well. Where are you, by the way? I forget where you live. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey. Oh, that's right. I'm in Washington. Well, I'm in. I'm outside Washington D.C. Of course, because you are in the world of think tanks. I mean, let me introduce this and tell people who you are, uh, in case they don't know. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. You're Christina Hoff Summers. Uh, you are a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. I don't know what your official title is there. Wait. Oh, you are a resident scholar, I think, at the American Enterprise yeah. Institute. Uh, Well-known intellectual, author of such books as Who Stole Feminism, The War Against Boys, and you are a more or less official member of the intellectual dark web about which we will talk. And if people don't know what that is, they should definitely stay tuned. It's <laughs> at least as exotic as it sounds. Um, and, uh, let me say, I mean, you know, I, I've been thinking about having you on the show or asking you if you wanted to be on the show, but what finally precipitated this was you calling me a sexist online. And I know what <laughs> I, 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 did I call, I didn't call you a sexist. No, here's I what you I said. said. I mean, here's uh, what you have the record. I've got the record. It's you, not fair to, realize. I think I tweeted this late at night. Uh, it was a holiday. Uh, I was overserved by Tamler, my stepson Tamler Summers, and uh, I heard you interviewing uh, someone. And wait a second, Tamler, I, Tamler of uh, Very Bad Wizards. Yes, that's your stepson. Yeah. Oh. In fact, we owe a great debt of gratitude to you because when he after he graduated college. He drifted. And he went. He didn't know what he was going to do. He went to, I don't know, he studied playwriting. And then the, it's Columbia. And the next year he was living in Montpellier. No, first France, Venice, and then Tahiti. And reading Somerset Mom. And I got worried about him. And I sent him your book, The Moral Animal. And he found it intriguing and just riveting. And he applied to graduate school in philosophy after that. Wow. And he saved his life. Yeah. And you know he's never sent me royalties. <laughs> he's never sent me royalties on, on a book or um or or from his Patreon uh his Patreon deal. But anyway, he's got he's got a great podcast, Very Bad Wizards, uh, along with David Pizarro. So um, so back to the Inquisition. Yeah, y you being on trial for uh for this, and I and I want to you know uh. I want to say I am going to spend a little time defending myself against this charge, but I'm not just being self-indulgent. I am being self-indulgent, but it's my show, so that's legal. Uh, but but also, yeah. I think the whole business of kind of, you know, like name-calling is, is uh, it's a big issue these days, you know, tribalism and so on. In fact, it's not unrelated to the mission, I, uh, if there is one, of the intellectual dark web. So let's, like, go through this. I do feel a need to defend myself. I admit that's petty and self-indulgent. But here was your tweet. I had done uh, this dialogue with Kate Mann, author of a, a well-known book called Down Girl about uh, misogyny. She's a philosopher. And you tweeted this after, I guess, seeing our encounter on this very platform. You, 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 you tweeted, want to see sexism in action? The usually clear-minded Robert Ryder, that's me, that's my Twitter handle, would never allow a male philosopher to be as dogmatic and ridiculously ideological as feminist Kate Mann was on his show. But she's a woman. Ah. But she's a woman. So he gave her a pass. And then the hashtag is everyday sexism. Now, wait a right. second. Did, did Tamler approve this tweet? Did you understand? No, no, no. Tamler's always annoyed with me when I show any emotion on Twitter. Well, God bless him. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so just kind of. But I think I think I, I think I stand by the tweet. I, I I shouldn't have used the word ridiculous, but I did I did feel <laughs> sexism. I'm her to call me a sexist. You shouldn't have called, shouldn't have called her ridiculous. Now, now wait 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 a minute. I didn't call you a sexist. Now and usually I when I and you read it in a tone that was uh, a little bit tendentious. I was just saying the usually brilliant and scintillating and tough minded Robert Wright yeah. just threw softballs at. Kate Mann, how could that be? And I, so I found it, a, I found it to be benevolent sexism. Because I've heard you, I've heard you interview, for example, 
a few weeks ago, you were on with uh, Robert Kaplan. Right. And you were going back and forth, and it was, it was, I thought it was great. I mean, you were both, it was a lively, intense exchange. Yeah. I've seen you with Tamler. You yeah. had, you, you were skeptical. You kept coming at him with questions. Right. You're, you, and, and I, I like this. I mean, it's one of the reasons right. your show is successful well, you, is you really investigate can ideas. And, can I give you some more examples? Okay. Can I give you some more examples of that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've done dialogues with Ann Althaus that got so contentious that she accused me of being sexist in the other sense of being <laughs> of, of being too hard on her. I'm serious. I mean, the point is, I can give you examples of my doing this with women uh, and, and of being, you know, uh, contentious and so on. And I would think that 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 starts to cast down on your uh, your 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 claim that the only relevant variable here was her gen was her gender or maybe sex, as you would say. Uh, so, you know, I mean, let me, let me explain to you what was going on from my point of view. And it's, it's, uh, it's funny, um, you know, after you did this, I actually looked up this email I had sent right after it. Somebody on my team who else now these things said, how did it go after I taped it with Kate? And I said, it went fine. I thought if I had been more provocative, given more pushback, it might've made for more views, meaning more traffic, more people would have watched it. And then I said, but I mainly wanted to illuminate her argument. That was my view, like right after the thing. And let me explain why that was the extent of my ambition, okay? okay. Uh, it's because I totally don't know that territory. When I'm arguing with Bob Kagan, it's about foreign policy. I have very well-formed views about foreign policy. She, I, the whole, and, and I hope you and I will talk a little about kind of the landscape of feminists. You're thought of as a conservative feminist, and some feminists on the left would say you're not even a feminist, and we can talk about that. But I don't know this territory, and, and um, I have long wished someone would actually define the term misogyny, and other terms, actually like feminist and like sexist and so on, a lot of these terms I, I'm still struggling to get a clear definition of. So she had written a whole book where she was trying to do that. So I wanted to focus on just like, so what does the term mean to you? Um, now, the, the, I think one thing it, you had in mind is, you know, I, the, the book you, of mine you, you mentioned, The Moral Animal, uh, I came out as, a, as a, uh, a backer of evolutionary psychology in that. Part of that worldview is that there are um, genetically based psychological differences between men and women, at least in the aggregate, although individuals differ and so on. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of the disclaimers we could do. Um, so you thought since her premise is um, that there aren't differences of that kind between men and women, I should have been giving her pushback on that. But, but see, the thing is, um, she hadn't written a book making the argument that there are these sex differences, right? I mean, another good contrast, just to show you that I'm willing to be contentious with women, was there was a, I did a dialogue with Lisa Barrett Feldman, is that her name? She wrote a book called How Emotions Are Made or something. I, um, I think that's her name. Uh, and this was like in, in 2017. Um, and uh, yeah, it's called How, How Emotions Are Made. Uh, or, or no, it's, it's Lisa Feldman Barrett, I think. But um, the... Uh, and it got really pretty contentious, but she was making an argument about human nature and the nature of emotions. And I've written whole books about that. Okay. So I felt like engaging her directly. With Kate, the thing was our premises differed so much, right? Uh, the okay. 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 Can I just say something? Sure. Fairly early on in the interview, uh, she, she was, she, she described an attitude or a practice as uh, that we have a blind spot to this. And then she said, oh my goodness, that's an ableist term. Uh, she said, I, I better say, we, we overlook this. And then she said, oh, that's more ableist. And she was sort of embarrassed that she used an ableist language. And you, you gently sort of suggested, well, overlook. <laughs> I mean, overlook is not ableist. I mean, do we, we over, 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 here is that ableist? I mean, you can take apart the entire language that way and find it, uh, you know, guilty of insensitivity. So it was it was slightly surprising that she did that, and then, and she carried on and she said that she tries very hard to confront her own bigotry and to own it, and, and it went on from there. But it was a big question, I would assume, for a lot of listeners 
whether that was an example of bigotry. So right there, I, I would have, I might have pushed back. I mean, do you think it, it was a normal thing to say? Well, I mean, whether it's statistically normal is irrelevant. There are all kinds of things that aren't normal that are that are right or or, <laughs> well, or, 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 I, I mean normal, I mean or are vindicated by subsequent intellectual history. My main thing is that's not what the conversation was about. It wasn't about ableism, and I haven't thought that through either. But but it's like, so you wanted me to stop her there and argue with her? The thing was about misogyny. I mean, that was okay. So let's move on. Let's move on and talk okay. about misogyny. So she 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 has a new definition of misogyny. I mean, misogyny is a term that goes back, I don't know, to the 16th century. Yes, there was a famous uh, pamphleteer uh, who wrote uh, contemptuous pieces about women, and then several women wrote back, and there was a fight. And someone wrote a play, and his nickname was Miso, Misogene or something like that. But mm -hmm. it's from the Greek, Miso, Gano, hatred of women. And then you get in the 19th century, misandry, hatred of men. Way before that is hatred of people, misanthropy. So, and the word, uh, I, I, I need a pretty strong argument to think we should change the meaning of the word because it seems to me uh, you have a sexist who is just sort of an ordinary, you know, uh, person, a person who has like some unfair views about women. And then you have a, a, show, a, a misogynist. It, it, there's, it means contempt and scorn, an attitude of derision. And then you might have chauvinists, chauvinists, and it goes, never mind. But anyway, they have different meanings and they're useful and we use them. But she wants to change it. Now you can change the meaning of the term, but only if you have a very good reason. And then she gave her reason. And it seemed to me to be totally question begging, which is that we, we, we what it means, she said, is that it's, it's like the police force of the patriarchal order or like a, a shot collar on a dog mm -hmm. is misogyny functions to correct women and put them back in their place when they challenge the, the patriarchal order. Well, I would, I mean, I would have asked her uh, it, about the patriarchal order because it seems to me to very, a, a rather extreme way to describe American society. And, and then well, to come up with misogyny and, and to, to compare women, American women with dogs with shot collars being controlled by this invisible Well, I don't, I don't think she meant the analogy to be uh, fully kind of proportionally representative along all dimensions. I don't think she was meant to be comparing women to dogs. No, fair enough. No, uh, except that they don't, uh, that, that, that there is some degree of power asymmetry, I think she was suggesting. But, um, but uh, let me just say. Actually not, actually not. She, I mean. She had an, I thought her, the thing is, I also found her very interesting, very smart. Right. And, but just, uh, it just, uh, it was almost like you had someone that really believed in tarot cards or, or maybe more oh. fair, like a very ardent uh, Freudian. A Freudian. Okay. That's, so that's, let me just say, I'm not, I'm not here uh, to defend her argument. Um, and the kinds of questions you're asking are the kinds of questions someone like you would ask. If you had I been did. in my shoes, these questions would have been asked. But, but, but my, I honestly came to this completely naively. I don't read this literature. I don't know the feminist landscape. Uh, from my point of view, as like an old white male, there are a number of terms that seem to be thrown around more loosely than they were when I was a kid, like white supremacist and racist and so on. I'm interested in asking people why that is. But in this case, she was actually not throwing it around loosely. She actually had a precise definition, and that's what I wanted to flesh out. So I didn't have, okay, well, I didn't have the background or the ideological commitment to ask the questions you would have asked. And so um, I didn't, I, I want to emphasize, I don't want to spend this whole time kind of with you raising questions about her argument, because I am not right. equipped to defend her. You know, I'm, oh, we're back. We just had a little uh, technical uh, exchange that may lead Christina's voice to sound different and better from here on in. But so, Christina, do you remember what I, I, I mean? My main point is, I, you know, maybe you and Kate, if you two want to have a conversation on this platform, that would be wonderful. Uh, and, and if you want a moderator, I might not be the right person, but it, but I'd be willing. <laughs> uh, so so you can do that. But I, I don't want to I don't want to like litigate her thing. I just want to no, of course, I just not. want to explain. Um, 
where I was coming from, and I, and I also want to ask you, like, if you accept my view that I could show you a number, my, my claim that I could show you a number of these conversations where I actually uh, have contentious exchanges with women and am very challenging, do you agree that would like be bad for your sexism explanation of this and you would need to look for another one? I'm going to go further than that. I'm going to say that I absolve you of the charge of sexism. I didn't really mean it. I was kind of trying to needle you. And in my defense, why did I write such an intemperate tweet other than my uh, previous yeah. explanation, which I won't go into? Mm. Uh, why did I do it? Uh, two reasons. One is that for years I have watched some, I would say, uh, unfortunate developments in feminist philosophy, a, a lot of uh, extremist views and odd eccentric claims about the world, and they they don't get corrected, and they don't get reviewed, and, and it's a, a whole body of research that has not really gone through the classic peer review process, mm -hmm. because we have a system of quality control in the academy, which is criticism. However, this literature, you will find, and I found this out years ago, that criticism can sometimes be viewed as backlash and a form of intellectual harassment. Mm -hmm. And I, because I, early on, I saw what I thought were some unfortunate tendencies in feminist philosophy, just too extreme and too, you know, just not at all evidence-based. They seem to be carried away with a rather, just this fanciful uh, 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 agenda about reality. Anyway, I would challenge it, and I, I, I did it at the American Philosophical Association and thought we'd have a good debate and go out for drinks. That did not happen. People were hissing and stamping their feet. And this was in like 1988. <laughs> and over the years, I've watched that this, and it, it's, it, I'll give you another example. I had a, a friend who taught uh, philosophy of science at MIT. And I, I won't say her name, but a very hardline theorist, feminist theorist, went to MIT and gave a paper about how male science was intrinsically sexist and, and oppressive. It was the male point of view and and extremely sexist. She went so far as to say that, you know, the sort of the male scientist brought nature to her knees. And well, she might actually have been quoting some bad metaphors in science books, but and there were plenty of metaphors. But she was going further and saying the practice itself was part of the, the, the this kind of corrupt male approach. And on and on, and it, somehow the phrase Newton's rape manual came up, Isaac Newton's rape manual came up. Anyway, I said to my friend, what did you do when she, what did you think of her theory? And he said, he said, I couldn't, under, he had a British accent, he said, I couldn't understand the first thing she was saying. I said, well, did you object? And he said, no, I'm just hoping it'll go away. So it went, you know. It, as far as I know, maybe it hasn't gone away because this, these sorts of theories are still out there and, and now gaining influence. So I'm so frustrated. So when Kate Mann, she's not as, as extreme as any of these people, but she shares some of the qualities that, that worry me. And I thought, oh, great, she'll be on with Robert Wright. He'll push back. He's scrappy. And, and it didn't happen. So I was disappointed. Yeah, disappointed so in me. So, but, and I over... Well, I mean, you've explained yourself, uh, and I can understand yeah. that. And it might even be, you know, if you had been as scrappy as you were with, with, let's say, uh, Eric Weinstein, you you pushed back you a lot. Brett. You mean Brett? Uh, I'm sorry, Brett. With Brett Weinstein, and I thought it was a very good discussion. But you you challenged him, you know, kept, uh, you know, uh, asking him questions and demanding clarity. So if you had done that. Maybe yeah. you would have been, well, well, I don't know, would you worry uh, that people would say that was sexist? Because I think that women need to have that. And, well, and Kate Mann is perfectly capable of handling that. Right. Although, although and the last thing I'll say is I did say some of these things in a response to her, some of her writings in the Boston Review. And she answered all the critics, but did not, I don't think there was a word about me. Hmm. Or no, no. So I, I was frustrated about that too. But anyway, enough 
about yeah, yeah no I, I, I um I, I I promised that um this was going somewhere other than a defense of myself and and here's where it's go here's one place it can go I do want to get back to feminism before the end of this conversation and talk about that from your point of view but you mentioned both Brett and Eric Weinstein, members of the Intellectual Dark Web. You are an official member of the Intellectual Dark Web. When I say official, I just mean that the Intellectual Dark Web had its kind of, I don't know, its kind of uh, debut uh, via the New York Times. Barry Weiss wrote a piece. Uh, here's the uh, lead paragraph. Here are some things that you will hear when you sit down to dinner with the vanguard of the intellectual dark web. There are fundamental biological differences between men and women. Actually, everybody agrees with that. I think she mean, means that there are genetically based psychological differences. I think most people will accept that there are evident biological differences. Anyway, free speech is under siege. Identity politics is toxic ideology that is tearing American society apart. And then she says, and we're in a dangerous place if these ideas are considered dark. But anyway, so the idea is there's these people with these who are, you know, there's these, uh, you know, courageous truth tellers saying the things nobody else is willing to say. And, and they have uh, been consigned to this intellectual dark web because society is not willing to hear their message. Maybe I'm caricaturing it a little, but that's kind of the spirit of the piece. Um, and what, one thing I want to I, I ask you, I, I mean... Well, we'll get back to the sexism charge. I, I, I'll, I'll leave people on the edge of the seats. I promise it's relevant. <laughs> but, but, but one thing, uh, a lot of people on the left consider the intellectual dark web a right-wing thing. Now, granted, Brett Weinstein, there are, you know, voted for Bernie Sanders or supported him in the primary something. Um, so uh, there is some diversity. On the other hand... People like Ben Shapiro, you're generally considered a conservative, you know, Dave Rubin, a lot, a lot of people who are considered pretty conservative. But I think if you ask why does a group with some degree of diversity get characterized as right wing, I think a lot of it is that people in the IDW spend a lot of time complaining about, criticizing, fighting with the so-called social justice warriors who are on the left, right? That is a fundamental dynamic. I would say almost a defining dynamic for the intellectual dark web. Is that fair? Well, first of all, uh, some, someone made, the, made it up as a joke, and then some, some unknown person just arbitrarily put together a website and, and named, you know, me, Ion Hersi Ali, I think Steve Pinker was there. And and Dave Mike, Rubin, Mike, Mike Shermer, so Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. So it, and I think what we had in common was perhaps that we are we became known more through alternative media. So I, I mean, I was, I have a series of videos called the Factual Feminist, and those. Oh, well, hey, I have to interrupt you. I have to interrupt you. Do you remember yeah. that we were on the same TV show about twenty years ago? Do you remember this? Which one? Ben, ben Wattenberg's Think Tank. Weren't you on that? Yes. What was the topic? It was this. It was, it, it was no, it was feminism. It was, it was like, oh, oh, it was like sex male, differences. female differences. You, it was more than 20 years ago. It's a distant memory at best, but you and, um, uh, the, the, you remember the book, um, you just, uh, you just don't understand her last name's Tannen, right? Oh, Deborah Tannen. Right. Yes. She was on it. It was you, me and her. So you were on, anyway, I guess I'm saying you actually had been on mainstream media. That was PBS. Uh, well, no, I, I know when I, my first book came out, I was on the media all yeah. the time. And, with, 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 and you forgot to mention my book with Sally Sattel, One Nation Under Therapy. Uh, I consider myself corrected. And I went on Jon Stewart and had a good, he was very nice and well, all go. sorts of shows. But anyway. But uh, but anyway, for whatever reason, I'm not saying it's entirely accurate. But Jordan Peterson became known through his videos, and uh, and I think uh, you know, I don't know, I on her see Ali, her, she, I guess she'd be a counterexample because she doesn't have a video uh, series. But I, th I don't know. I think they just wanted to find people who were fighting what they saw was a kind of cultural authoritarianism. Now I'm someone that sees authoritarianism on the right and the left. I, I do not identify as a conservative. I'm a 
I'm still registered as a Democrat, and I'm probably li more liberal than many people on m s certain social issues. Uh, so I don't, you know, but I feel politically homeless. So, okay. But anyway. But you, but would you agree that I mean, most of the the fighting is between the the, the IDW and the SJWs, right? I mean, what what, what, uh, what I guess what no, I'm asking I don't is, agree I, with that. I guess what I'm asking is, like. I'm not only asking this, this is, again, a, a kind of a self-centered question, but like when you complain that the SJWs, that social justice are throwing around terms like white supremacist and racist and sexist too loosely, like, can you see how, from my point of view, I ask myself the question, well, what is the difference between that and this member of the IDW calling me a sexist just because I didn't, I didn't represent her ideological or her viewpoint the way she would have wanted it represented or something right i mean what is the difference what is the difference between you calling me a sexist and the social justice warriors calling other people sexist without without sufficient i think you now agree like without sufficient you, know what? I, 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 you were really you were really just Stressed at me calling you a sexist. No, I it's, didn't, I, I, it's just that, no, I didn't mean I, it that way. I mean, I, I honestly wasn't particularly, but it seems to me that if you ask where the energy for this question is coming from, it's coming more from the the idea that the it seems to me that the IDW is presented as almost not having an ideological agenda, and yet they do seem to spend 98% of their time complaining about these people on the left. And I doubt any of them complained when like you called me a sexist or if you call, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, well, uh, uh, I mean, we can, we can, uh, I can give you so many counter examples that, uh, and what I think is more serious uh, and maybe for me, the better organization, because it is an organization would be heterodox Academy. And right. there, you have Jonathan Haidt and, I don't know, 2,000-plus professors, and I urge everyone to check it out, read the website. And I just think it's a model of how to organize an inclusive organization. And it, it, and he's influenced me. I mean, I, I, I don't think – I mean, I don't want to say I didn't because somebody will find it somewhere on YouTube. But I don't think I use the words like snowflake and – I, I try not to do that and just denigrate people. I usually try to understand them and meet them halfway, but stipulate maybe on Twitter. I, I did something bad <laughs> many more, more than once. So I don't disagree with you. And uh, certainly Eric and Brett Weinstein think the way that I do, and Heather, uh, we think that way. And uh, I did speak to Jordan Peterson the other day, and he has a friend, Greg Hurwitz, who's telling him, you know, if you want to communicate with people and you want to get your point across, don't start by saying things that just, you know, set off uh, all sorts of explosions in their brain. They can't listen to you and they feel insulted or dismissed. So right. he's trying to take that lesson, lesson to heart. So Is he actually, you know, I mean, it, is Jordan Peterson actually trying to moderate his message? Or, or at least not the content, but the stylistically? What, what, well, what's interesting about him is if you actually go to his lectures, which I did once in D.C., and I didn't know what to expect because I did at the time, I didn't really know that much about him. And then I met him a few days ago because he was, I have a podcast. I guess everybody in the Every, Everyone States does have a, a podcast, podcast, yes. <laughs> you had the first one, right? Did you invent it? We were early. Well, I wouldn't, I mean, what we had was the first split-screen video uh, discourse about politics and public issues and stuff. Uh, I'm only aware of one split screen video thing that was earlier. It was a tech. It was Leo Laporte beat us by a few months with this uh, the week in tech thing. But but on politics and public affairs, we we were there and we from the very beginning had downloadable audio, so it was available as audio only. But uh, I, you know, I know. So I, I would say the, the answer is no. I, I don't think I can claim to be. The, so, so go ahead. <laughs> you, you invented. So anyway, the point is, so, um, and and I met him because for the Femsplainers, my podcast. And uh, it, what's interesting is that he, when he gives lectures and if you read his book, there's nothing that's that contentious. It's, it's a lot of common sense. It's uh, just sort of parables and stories and, 
sort of entertaining and interesting and edifying. He's thought to be highly controversial because there, there's a, a, it's mainly journalists that make assumptions about him and they meet him and then start playing gotcha, gotcha, and then he gets, you know, in these exchanges. Thousands of people, he fills stadiums and they come to hear right. what I think is lectures that are, uh, that people are just sort of hungry for uh, philosophical conversations. And he ex excels in the philosophy. I don't know if you did this in college, but I took some religious studies courses and would read like Paul Tillich and Victor Frankl and Mircea Eliade. And he, he's sort of in that tradition, mm -hmm. mythic. And uh, I, I, th I think of Joseph Campbell as in many ways, he's a Joseph Campbell type, but, but anyway. Right, right. Uh, that's pretty good, uh, pretty apt. Uh, he's not that political. In fact, I found him somewhat naive about politics because I just, you know, he did, he just, there, I didn't, there's no, I don't see any politics uh, that could be arguably a left or right in his book that on the, on the 12 rules. He's, uh, so anyway, he, I don't see him as explicitly political, though he may have made mistakes and appeared on shows or he gets very angry about certain issues, but he's not dealing with trivial issues. He's talking to young people, especially young men about life and death issues, about mm -hmm. personal responsibility, about developing competences and, and, and being, you know, uh, fulfilling your uh, potential as a human being and not wasting it in, in pointless pursuits. And there are, there is a sort of, a sort of a crisis of young men in education and disappearing yeah. young men out of the workplace. And, but there are a lot of women now, he, 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 certainly reading his book, women buy books more than men, and I think in this case, this book is very readable and amenable uh, for women. Anyway, so I, w I would say in his case, he's not a good example. So I think you've bought in a little bit of a caricature, although maybe I, I, I try now, like on Twitter, no, if but, but even says he says something... Even he is kind of at war with the SJWs. It's just a really dominant dynamic. I mean, in other words, if you ask what does everyone in the IDW have in common, I would say almost the only thing is they've all done battle with the social justice warriors, right? But but wait a minute. Yeah, you, know, you keep saying that's another problem with what you're saying is that I don't care if some some you know a small group somewhere does something crazy. I do care when James Damore is fired from Google for saying what, you know, perfectly reasonable things. I, I mean, his tone maybe was a little off, but overall, uh, this was just sort of standard uh, set of arguments that you would find mm -hmm. in any good uh, text about male-female differences. And he reports, so that when you find it moving into the mainstream society, and I do think some of the bad ideas, not of SJWs, but that came out of the uh, maybe critical theory or the radical feminist philosophers I talked about earlier, other parts of the, these used to be just off in a corner in the university. But I see these ideas sort of advancing and finding their way into journalism, into, uh, I would say, high tech, Silicon Valley in any case, and in perhaps in Hollywood. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I actually was speaking a little too narrowly, by the way, when I said that the only thing they have in common is war with the SJWs. But but I do think, you know, broadly speaking, the ideology represented that they see as represented by the SJWs is kind of what what they are united um, a, a, against the kind of the speech code as the SJWs, uh, they think, would like to define it and, and the subjects that are and aren't, um, you know, uh, things that are and aren't acceptable to say. But anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on that, but, but, but my, uh, I guess I'd ask you, well, what, what, how would you crisply define what does everyone in the intellectual dark web have in common? I mean, I think in the Barry Weiss uh, article, one theme was, you know, no one will listen to them. And, and that's kind of, I think not. No, no, not no. It, that's not it. I mean, if you look at it's their platforms of... alone, they, they, if you look at like the people who were mentioned, you know, Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, uh, Dave Rubin, I mean, their shows alone online are very big uh, 
Exactly, exactly. Be. And that's why that's why it's a big deal. Because Joe Rogan and Dave Rubin, they do have big audiences. And the question is why? And I think what probably unites the various characters in the IW, in the intellectual dark web, is that we're saying things and presenting arguments that that are a lot of people find refreshing. And I get letters all the time that people discover my factual feminist video series where I go through and I have, I don't know, about 62, and I just evaluate various feminist claims, try to garner the best evidence I can from the most, you know, uh, reliable sources and just give good information on the wage gap or women in science or, uh, you know, uh, are women being harassed and and threatened on the in, in cyberspace and so forth. I, I look at the data. And I get letters from people who just say, I, I can't believe you exist because they've had so many courses where they only heard one point of view that I think that a lot of us became popular. I'm not anywhere near the popularity of Peterson or Rogan or Shapiro, but in my way, popular because you offer, you, I think people felt uh, uh, relieved that they weren't, they knew something was amiss in some of the teachings and always, you know, learning because a lot of the stuff I criticize and perhaps uh, the, the wine seed, it's, it's become entrenched in the uh, curriculum. So these kids have had it all their lives. And then they find someone that says something else and, and seems, you know, to have some pretty good arguments and good evidence. And it's it very, uh, it, for them, they're, they're become fascinated and they become fans. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, by the way, I, I would suggest that Jordan Peterson not change his style too much. I mean, I actually think uh, a, 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 a very effective thing he does is like the stark pronouncement, right? You know what I mean? He does this thing where he'll say this thing that at first seems a little shocking it's so stark he shouldn't surrender that that's like the key to his <laughs> half of his success i think no he, he he's i think look there there i there's certain people that i just envy for their lecture style because i do not have a great lecture style i don't know and and well i won't say that yeah i, I there i don't know that many women who do, and even this, the feminist in me wants to be like, I, I, women can do this, we should be able to, but, but you look at Jonathan Haidt, and there are two I have in mind, and Peterson, and you can't stop listening to them. They're mesmerizing, and they just have a way of going around. A part of it is they're brilliant, and they just ha seem to have instant access to all sorts of mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Camille Paglia is great, too. Hmm. But again, it's, it's, you, no one could copy her. It's, it, she's uh, one of a kind. But uh, I agree, but he's a great storyteller. And he's also, what I found uh, meeting him, is that a lot of times when he's talking, he's actually talking to himself. He's a, a person who has had clinical depression. He does see, uh, you know, finding uh, your way, you know, sort of critical to survival. And, and there are a lot of depressed people, and more than I imagined. I looked at the data the other day, I was just surprised at the levels of depression anxiety it's very high mm -hmm. and I, he, I think he i think that's far more um in, you know where you'll find an explanation for his popularity than mm -hmm. you know the inner then you know fighting with uh, what you social justice warriors that's just, just he, mm -hmm. he doesn't even do that in the in, on stage very <laughs> when he's with dave rubin and he's there with ben shapiro maybe five minutes they talk about that and then they're off in a conversation debating you know, uh, Maimonides uh, and you know the, the the philosophers of the Middle Ages and 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 Christianity and Judaism and they're very archaic but exciting mm -hmm. intellectual conversations mm -hmm. about about religion and about you know why we are here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me uh, say one more thing about why I'm interested in this because I realize it's a chance for me to plug this newsletter we put out called the Mindful Resistance Newsletter at mindfulresistance.net. Um, what we we spend a lot of time in that critiquing the the resistance the, uh you know to trumpism i mean i want to resist it but i want to resist it effectively and i think um the resistance is often too tribal for its own good too wrapped up in the psychology of tribalism 
overreacting to things Trump says, not really checking facts before they, you know, and, and there's a lot of things that just happen just because we're it's tribal times. We're all very kind of revved up. So, um, you know, and I guess so I've, I've wound up, uh, although I have I'm as tribally minded as anybody by nature. I mean, it's not like I am by nature a dispassionate person, but but we have, you know, we, we've started this thing where uh, we write about this every week. And one thing I do is kind of sometimes call people out. You know, I call out the New York Times for being biased in its coverage of Trump um, and stuff like all, all of these things. And so and I and I get the sense some and, and tell me if this is just wrong, but I almost get the sense that the IDW thinks of itself as not being tribal, having transcended tribalism. And I see it as very tribal and I could cite more examples. And that's not some huge indictment. These days, everyone is part of a tribe. and They're being tribal. But I think the IDW is 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 uh, tribal. It 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 protects its own. Ben, ben Shapiro says something that in my mind is completely indefensible uh, and they kind of rally around him. And, and uh, you know, he's a, the, the, the maybe you're familiar. What, 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 what did he say? What did he say? That's oh, it's the, it's the infamous tweet. I'm reluctant to, uh, you know. I've, OK, I'm, all right. All right. No, I'll tell you the, you know, I'll tell you the tweet. Uh, it, I know the tweet and he's apologized for it well, a I thousand times. Not earnestly. Can you I, believe the, the big thing he did where he where he said, uh, the, the piece he wrote about, well, things, you know, things I've done that were suboptimal. I don't think he apologized, but he actually misrepresented the tweet in that. He, he said, you know, he, he acted as if it was in a context. There were other tweets. There weren't other tweets. What year was the tweet? What year was the tweet? Oh, I don't know, but it was and so he- egregious. It was so egregious. And I mean, this is a good example. Is like, it was like, you know, Arabs like to live in open sewage and blow stuff up or something israelis like to build stuff now if you and and that was about the tweet and they said settlements rock it was a pro you know israeli settlement thing that was about the tweet that's almost verbatim if you said that about jews jews like to live in open sewage and blow shit up you said that about blacks like to live in open sewage and blow shit up you would be expelled from polite discourse unless you apologized abjectly and maybe not even then and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing but in the case of Arab, well, I, I'll just, uh, okay, yeah. just remind you, Ben's pretty young, so he, he was younger when he did that. He used to be a bit of a bomb thrower. He was at Breitbart News, and then he had a change of heart, and he left Breitbart. He thought it was, too, he didn't want, he was very much anti-Trump. He was anti the whole politics that uh, uh, was developing, alt-right politics developing there. And then he became a target of the most, uh, according to the ADL, he was, of all journalists, he was the most targeted with anti-Semitic attacks and and, and on social media and all sorts of things. And I do think he's grown up and he's changed. He would never say anything like that now. And he is sorry for it now. And I've met him several times and I just don't see any trace of that recklessness. I disagree with him. He's He's a conservative Orthodox Jew and in many my many family members who are Orthodox Jews, I understand it and respect it, but I just don't agree. Well, uh, what so he mean, does have, yeah. I just all I'm saying is I'm not even you know. Uh, all I'm saying is the idea. Like when I asked Brett Weinstein about it on on my podcast, his tendency was to say, "Well, I think if you look at it in context, it's not as bad as it looks." His tendency was to defend him. His brother Eric, when 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 um, uh, when Shapiro did this thing that I don't think it was a very thoroughgoing mea culpa, but uh, uh, you know e- Eric kind of touted it as okay, kind of he's made amends. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Maybe I've got it wrong, but it was it was something you know he uh, um, a lot that was the vibe. And if you actually look at the so-called mea culpa, he actually just misrepresent. He, he just says. No, you know, if people would have paid attention, they'd see that there were, you know, and he acts as if there, it was part of a series of tweets. It just wasn't. What happened was it got blowback, so much blowback that like an hour after the tweet, he kind of quasi walked it back. But you know what's, well, I won't say hilarious. It's, it's bizarre in my mind. You know what his walk back was an hour later? I shouldn't have said Arabs. I meant just Palestinians. 
Yeah, well, that's not <laughs> okay. Not good enough. But but but, but all I want to say is all I want to say is I think if this had been a social justice warrior uh, who said something egregious, and then they they do this half-ass mea culpa, I think people in the IDW would have inspected the mea culpa very carefully, the way I inspected Ben's, because I'm in the opposite tribe from Ben. Okay, so but what about what, what, what about but but and I'm not saying it's what a, a crime. I'm not saying it's a crime. I'm just saying, I'm I'm kind of asking you, is the is the vibe of the IDW that they are not tribal? I'm just saying they're ordinary people with a they they, they bonded, they they stand up for one another, and it's like a tribe. Well, that's, wait, that's wait, 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 first of all, it, it just seems to loom larger in your mind than in the real world. There are no meetings. It, it, it had a, a it, somebody took a picture. It was mainly because of the picture uh, that it became known. This strange picture. They sent a photographer to my mother's house in Portland, and um, he, he wanted to go out in the backyard. And it, it, but it was mainly because we couldn't stay in the house because my mother's untrained dog Clover was barking. So we had to go out in the backyard. And I think it was kind of an accident mm. that these movies. These anyway, it doesn't matter. But it, the picture had a lot to do with it. And it's not a it, it's it, it, it's not a club, it's not a movement. It's a loose network of people okay. with a, a fairly large following. In some cases, not mine, but in many of them, on the uh, on social media. That's all. The and we tend to cluster around issues like uh, d- defending a diversity of opinion and not persecuting someone for having a uh, an outrageous. You know, just ha- having a point of view that people view as mm-hmm. that the left finds unacceptable or something. We want to, you know, defeat them by argument, not through censorship. Yeah, the the uh, the pictures are very striking, by the way. I mean, they they, they manage to impart this aesthetic, uh, this almost surreal aesthetic was that was consistent with the image of an intellectual dark web. Um, <laughs> the uh, so do do you think I'm wrong? There isn't this. There isn't this this claim of being not tribal kind of is that no i i think i think uh it as you said it runs very deep in us and we form bonds and especially if you're you know in a kind of an emotional issue and people for people politics is extremely personal and emotional and they're you know you put yourself out there with your point of view and then people bond with you so of course so i do uh, enjoy the company of almost all of them when i'm able to see them And, uh, you know, I just, I find affinities with them. But I think uh, as a movement, the more serious, uh, organized intellectual movement against the orthodoxy in the universities and increasingly other parts of the society, I think it's coming from Heterodox Academy. Yeah. I think that, that's... Yeah, that's just... uh, That's just John Haidt thing. I mean, it's... it's, uh it's funny, John was on Ezra Klein's uh, uh, podcast, and Ezra no- noted, like, you know, noted that John, when John gets passionate, it's when he's talking about the social justice warriors. Um, and, uh, but um, that was a good conversation that I encourage people to have. But you're right, the, so the, the, uh, the Heterodox Academy is more of a formal thing. I mean, my sense is that Eric Weinstein is is kind of kind of going with the IDW thing as a somewhat uh, formal thing, but may, maybe I'm wrong about that. Well, I think there is an idea to bring people, maybe to uh, have a, sort of a alternative learning centers mm-hmm. and places people could. But I mean, I don't know any formal steps that have been made. Mm. But I do find that on some campuses there's such just a rigid uh, orthodoxy and a lack of any diversity. I, I've spoken at campuses that are so carried away. Now, stipulate it tends to be these precious, you know, Ivy League colleges, Oberlin and 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 uh, recently where oh well, I was at well, this was a law school. I spoke at Lewis and Clark Law School, and you know they came and protested and wouldn't let me speak and and it was ridiculous to see this at a law school and i was not saying anything i don't think most people regard what i say as incendiary it's um it's different from what you'd hear from a standard gender studies scholar or feminist philosopher but it's fairly common sense 
common sense base, but they treated me as if I was, um, you know, uh, uh, they actually, and this is one thing that's taught that worries me. It is being taught in, it, maybe not in the classes so much as there's a whole bureaucracy now of college life, you know, various assistant deans of dormitories and like, and they, they're teaching a lot of strange things to young people uh, about speech being violence. So I think they thought that because I was saying things that was supporting the, uh, the patriarchal uh, capitalist uh, white supremacist system, because I was saying things that could be said to support it, that that was kind of equivalent to violence. Mm -hmm. So I, it worries me that, that that's not challenged more. That idea that no, I, I actually, I actually think the momentum is in your direction. Um, I, I think. Oh, I hope so. Well, I, I, so. I actually think a, a couple of things are going on. I mean, I think the argument uh, about whether identity politics has been tactically kind of bad for Democrats and liberals is I, I think it's starting to get a little pick up on the left. And I thought um, an interesting uh, thing recently was that, uh, what was the exact um, context for this? It was, uh, this was a tweet thread by Jesse Singhal, I think S-I-N-G-H-A-L. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jesse Singhal. Uh, about, about a Glenn Greenwald uh a subtext of something that Glenn wrote, which was apparently a critique of the way some of the younger staffers uh, at The Intercept, where Glenn Wright, <laughs> were getting, I forget what the exact thing was, but it was about them getting triggered by something. Right, they right, right. I, I saw that. Yeah, okay. So I think, you know, when you get people like Glenn who are uh, – and it makes sense in a way that, that given the kind of discourse Glenn wants to foster and, and it may be, he's been saying this forever and I haven't picked up on it, but um, the idea that, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, enough with the triggering stuff, uh, at least in some contexts, I do think the, um, the identity, you know, the thought is being given among liberals to the, the virtues of identity politics as kind of your, your opening, you know, your opening bid. Um, I don't know. Maybe, but, 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 uh, but, uh, also, I just, don't know. Just listening to the conversation between Ezra and John Haidt and, and you know, uh, I, uh, I, the other thing is, you know, there's just a huge amount of attention to the, like, tribalism has become a buzzword. Like I, you know, uh, I, I've been using the term for a while. I, I always mean it metaphorically. I, I don't think the psychology of tribalism was really designed by natural selection so much to foster wars between large groups. But it is a psychology, and 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 that's become this big buzzword. And everyone and polarization. Everyone's aware of the problem, and just more and more resources are going into doing something about it and trying to get everyone to calm down. So. I know. So, someone told me the other day that free speech is now, you know, if you talk about defending free speech, that's synonymous with the far right. <laughs> it's so confusing to me because that was, I always associated it with the left growing up and my parents were very left wing and, you know, First Amendment and freedom of expression it was, and things, you know, become politicized and then sort of well, toxic right. well, from right. one side but, or the other. But it, but it gets to the to my question, like if you want to avoid that stereotype, then try to make sure that your critiques are ideologically kind of evenly distributed. I mean, it gets back to what I said, is like, did anyone from the IDW say, um, Christina, you're using the se term sexism too loosely. Are you trying to <laughs> shut down Bob Wright's podcast? No, nobody would say that on the IDW. They don't care. They do care more about that kind of thing coming from social justice warriors. I mean, that's, it's, I mean, again, you, you know, uh, so, so I, well, there was an attempt, there was an attempt recently to, uh, well, I don't know how close it came, but there, a professor, I forget, Temple University somewhere had said some uh, very harsh, seemingly, yeah, I don't know, anti-Israel things actually. And, but they were harsh and he was 
yeah, the he, board of trustees was talking yeah, about he's the guy who was on him, C- it, CNN fired him first of all he's an African American right. right CNN fired him for using a phrase I think from the river to the sea he said he was for a single right. state he didn't say you know he didn't say like I want to drive the Jews out of Israel or I want or anything else but he was for I guess a you know a kind of a uh, in effect, the one state solution, there are different versions of that. That in itself is not a crime. But, but apparently the phrase from the river to the sea is also used by Hamas in a more incendiary context. And so people said, uh, I'm just setting the context. Now, go ahead and, t- and, and, and tell me what you were going to say. And a lot of people uh, like fire the Foundation for Individual, right- individual Rights and in Education just doing a great job defending mm-hmm. free expression and, and intellectual diversity on campus. They came to his you know, defense, and many of the people that I follow, uh, like, uh, in, you know, that are with me on this, like Kathy Young, and my, we were all, uh, probably, I don't know, Barry Weiss, perhaps, uh, were seeing that this was, I mean, I see it as very dangerous. Not that I agree with what he said, but... Uh, People that know him, people that I respect, were saying that he's, you know, responsible, good person. I take that to heart. And so I thought it was outrageous that his job, that he lost his job, uh, you know, and they threatened his academic freedom and at a public university. So, uh, you know, in that case, we did, people did defend him. I know I tried. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I, and I would suspect that Heterodox Academy made some formal show of support. I don't know. Is that, do you know if that's the case? I would hope they did. Uh, I just know that there were a lot, a lot of the usual people, the usual suspects, <laughs> IDW heterodoxy types were, for example, Robbie Sove, uh, who's very good. He's at Reason. He's a libertarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, but very, very excellent on these issues. And he's, he is as, as quick to um, criticize the right uh, as the left, and the left is the right. He's just right there. And I, I mean, it's hard for me sometimes because some of these professors drive me nuts, but then I can see the principle at stake, and I will defend them. Mm-hmm. Their right to free speech, not necessarily their ideas. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk more about feminism? And, uh, you, you know, yeah, I just want to say a few things. Yeah, go Just ahead. In case people are wondering, is that I do um, consider myself a feminist, and I have been since, I don't know, high school. <laughs> My mother was a feminist, and I read all the books. Everyone, uh, But I, as I wrote in my first book, Who Stole Feminism, I made a distinction between uh, sort of classical liberal equality feminism versus my colleagues in feminist philosophy, whom I called gender feminists. And that was short for uh, a phrase they used. Uh, Many of them described something called the sex gender system. For them, women's, uh, women weren't merely uh, held back by arbitrary barriers. Their object, their uh, women's oppression in the United States, even in the 80s and 90s, they said it was systemic, that it was uh, you know, that every major institution, you know, the, the universities, the Everything, art, you know, science, medicine, it all bears the impress of patriarchy. And they tended to take a fairly radical point of view. They didn't think that liberalism and, you know, reform was, was enough. We needed to dismantle the, 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 and they usually included capitalism. And now it's longer, I think, uh, uh, one feminist philosopher, uh, gender scholar, Bell Hooks, calls it the capitalist, patriarchal, white supremacist. Uh, society. So they take a very, very harsh view of our society. They have very little confidence in our traditions. Ah, that was the dog. <laughs> the mailman came, so. I'm familiar with that momentary. dynamic. Uh, <laughs> feel free to bring the dog on. A real, real crowd pleaser. Can I, can I get her just for a second? Because she's a little. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one second. Okay. I will entertain them while you're doing this. I'll um, juggle or something. Okay. So. Christina, um, a day has passed since uh, I last saw you. When I last left you, you were going to get your dog, and then all hell broke loose, and, and all our entire technological infrastructure fell apart. And so we, we vowed to renew the conversation today, which is what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I looked. 
I looked back at the tape and we we had gone close to an hour. So I guess at this point, if we go much longer, we're going to go full on Joe Rogan, like like one of these epic things, which is fine. There's plenty. But of- I, I I have so much to say that I, I, I you know the uh, esprit de scalier. You know, I was thinking. Oh, I should have said that, and I should. Have, so now I will. Well, it might be just tedious, say but. it all. Go ahead, say it all. <laughs> no, uh, just where were we? We left off with well, you asking you where, me. I went and checked to see where we were. You were talking about uh, gender feminists, and I guess uh, how you had um, come to realize that they wanted to uh, tear down the establishment as opposed to just. Uh, Something or other. I, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but um, I, I think we were talking about the landscape of uh, feminism, and you right. were talking about feminists that I that I think are more uh, radical from your point of view than you would like. Right, and by that, what I meant to say is that there is a tradition coming out of critical theory that's very, um, let's say, suspicious of you know, the traditional, classical, liberal uh, democracy. And so you would find, for example, uh, I always took for granted the primacy of the Bill of Rights and due process and freedom of expression. And in this tradition, there's a a, sort of a hermeneutic of suspicion and, you You know, uncut... Suspicion of males? Well, of males, but of traditions, of the liberal tradition. There's a, a, a what you find in the early feminist f- feminist philosophical texts is um, I, I think a lot of them may have come in from the uh, new left and maybe they brought these theories with them. I'm not sure quite how they got there. I don't know the exact because it's not continuous with early uh, with first wave or early second wave feminism. First wave feminism and early second wave feminism just come directly out of of classical liberalism it's it's applying to women and in, you know including women in the uh doctrines of freedom and can equality you, can you uh for those of us not all that conversant in the history of feminism can you quickly characterize first and second wave feminism yeah in the first wave feminism in the 19th century it was uh, basically t- to get women you know basic right to vote and the first wave sort of ends with when, when women finally get the vote in the mm-hmm. early 20th century. Then the second wave comes in the, uh, in the early 60s. And initially, many feminist scholars look back it as a kind of golden age of feminism because in the early second wave, there was massive agreement around just the, the basic justice of giving women equal access to institutions and taking down all these artificial barriers that held women back. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court was knocking down, you know, one after another of sort of sexist sexist laws. And that, but that movement, that equity, you know, what I call equity feminism, where you want for women what you want for everyone, you know, equal opportunity, liberty, dignity, that movement is still very strong around the world, and I think for, it's, a, it's a great American success story. I mean, if you just see how women are faring in American society, it's unprecedented in, in human history, and arguably American women are among the freest, most self-determining in the world. But in the academy, there was, there was really not, uh, what I found was an, an, a lot of antagonism towards equity feminism and the liberal tradition. And that's what I've called gender feminism. It's short for the uh, feminists who believe there's a sex gender system, that mm-hmm. women are a subordinate class, and that the uh, second class citizenship or the subordination of women is intrinsic to the what they sometimes call the you know the patriarchal hegemony, mm-hmm. and I you know even when I even in the, let alone today, but even in the late eighties when I was reading this stuff, I didn't and it just didn't make sense to call American society patriarchal. There were women had problems, there were obstacles, but we had a very effective system of, uh, to change things, and and we have. Um, so, but there, but it almost seemed to me is is the better things were for women, 
the more radical feminism be, uh, in the academy became. Mm-hmm. And then you would get people like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon. Now, what people, some students today may not know, is that Catherine McKinnon it was a brilliant legal scholar, and, and Dworkin was a brilliant woman, but together they embraced a very radical theory about American society and the oppressiveness of the of the male. <laughs> and so it was very, very, uh, well, some people called it sex phobic. I mean, it was almost as if they saw, uh, you know, every aspect of, of life for women in America uh, just completely compromised by a, this violent patriarchy by which women were kept subordinate to men. Now, there were a lot of feminists who fought back and did not like what they saw, they thought of as the sort of hyper Puritanism of Dworkin and, and McKinnon. And then McKinnon and Dworkin at one point were in league with some uh, very right wing people trying to censor Playboy. And, you know, they had various uh, adventures with those groups. But anyway, it was, it, and, and I think that um, the pro sex feminists who were, you know, like people like Nadine Strassen and Daphne Patai and, oh, I can't remember all the names, uh, Carol Vance, and then there, and later would come Camille Paglia and so forth. Uh, we won the argument. I was part of that. that. Was that, was that, is this a universally shared view that you won, that you won the argument? Well, I'll put it this way. If you go back and look at editorials in the New York Times, New York Magazine, you know, it, just in the media, it, I would think most people would, were very surprised by the radicalism of McKinnon and Dworkin. And um, my sense was that we won the argument in, in the court of public opinion, but they won the assistant professorships. They mm. just quietly, they were not impressed by our arguments, even the arguments of sister feminists in the academy um, were thought to be just wrong. And so the, the theories of McKinnon and, 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 and Andrea Dworkin, they are, they're back today. Uh, and now they've merged with intersectionality, which is, you know, this idea that you can't just, it's not simply that women are oppressed by patriarchy, but depending on their identities, they are, can also be oppressed by the intersection of Systems of racism, classism, heterophobia, ableism, lookism, and on and on. So there's a proliferation of oppression categories. And that's right now, if you go to the website of the National Women's Studies Association, th- this is what you'll hear that, that, that you know, the, and by the way, there, isn't even, there aren't even that many women's studies departments. They're changing their names to gender studies because even the the category of woman has been problematized. <laughs> and so it's um, increasingly, I, I just think, um, carried away with um, a, a philosophy about uh, the, the, you know, the complicated ways in which women are oppressed by a, a violent patriarchy um, and, you know, and, and bringing in these, mm. particularly women who, with, with, uh, uh, multiply marginalized identities, and they're, but they're just describing a world that I don't think exists. So it, to me, it's it's um, no, it's it wasn't reality based in 1988, and today it seems to have gone and you know just almost um, it's it's a it, it to me it is this is too extreme to call it madness, but it seems to me kind of like madness. Because you, how could you look at American society and say that it's, it's a patriarchal, oppressive male hegemony? Well, I guess, um, I mean, let me say a couple of things. I, I, guess, I think, I, I, I doubt they would deny there's in progress, I guess. What, and, 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 but I think if you said, hey, it's better for women uh, in America than it is in other places, they might say, yeah, well, it's better for dogs in America than in China. But they're not exactly equal citizens, you know. We don't eat dogs here, but, but, you know, <laughs> so, so, um, but then I, I'd ask for their evidence. Like what, give me, uh, evidence of, I mean, I look around and what I see, I think if you were someone coming, you know, an alien coming to planet earth, 
and you were asked, you know, who's better off, men or women, in the United States, it, it, it would be hard to say because it's a complex mix of benefits and burdens mm. for each sex. I mean, women are better educated. Women live longer. Women uh, have more appear to have more choices in, in uh, what they, you know, sorts of things they study well, in school. <clears throat> but, you know, I assume you'd agree that, like, there are certain things... Uh, and you might say this is unavoidable, but like a woman with career aspirations faces, uh, if if she uh, aspires to also have children, faces kinds of trade offs that men don't, and, and and kinds of obstacles. I'm not saying that's Absolutely. equally soluble. I'm not saying it's even part of a patriarchy, but but it's not like it's not like being a woman is just like being a man. That's right, and there is no question that women have special challenges and problems. And but on the other hand, so do men. So, as I said, women, men are struggling in education. There's a huge problem. It's getting worse of men, young men in their prime working years between 25 and 54, just not just unemployed, not seeking employment. Yeah. And, and I think it was, uh, yeah, Larry, Larry Summers, the economist, predicts that if, we, if things don't change in uh, – you know, 25 years from now, as many as a third of the uh, men between, you know, 20 and 21 and 54 will be out of the workplace altogether. Um, and, you know, you have, fig you know, high rates of male suicide. I mean, if you wanted to do this and you wanted to, you know, garner all these statistics, and if there were men's groups that did this, they were just, there's nothing compared to the uh, number of groups there are for women, because for good reason, women needed a lot of organizations to promote, you know, the second wave uh, reforms. But these organizations never went away. So you have groups mm -hmm. like the American Association of University Women. Initially, they were struggling for equality for women in education. Well, what do you do mm -hmm. if women aren't only 50 percent, as, as happened, I think, in the 80s, they then become on many campuses we're seeing, you know, it's going up to 57, 58 59 percent and the projections of the Department of Education just show that it, this this gap is is going to become a chasm and it's in it's across ethnic groups and uh, social classes the me, women are getting better educated they, they do better in school than their male counterparts that's just one area so what, what I'm saying is that there are it's because of I think it just the situation in life, there are special struggles for each group. Men, by and large, take on most of the gritty, dirty, uh, uh, dangerous jobs. There's a huge gap in terms of workplace fatalities. It's something about Labor Department. 5,000 people die on the job every year, and it's about 94% men. So there's a you know fatality gap, a gender fatality gap. But we just don't have groups to speak of that are pointing that out. Oh, I think and we have more than we used to. I think we'll we'll hear from some of them in the comments section, uh, especially on yeah. on the YouTube channel to mention of this. But but um, let me let me ask you a question. So I think <clears throat> it's kind of commonly thought. I mean, if I'm recalling our conversation from yesterday correctly, you mentioned my book, The Moral Animal. It's about evolutionary psychology. And among those who believe that there are uh, some uh, significant psychological differences between men and women that are genetically based, again, with all the, the right, uh, right, disclaimers, right. there's statistical aggregate, not necessarily applying to anyone and so on. <laughs> but, but I think it's commonly thought that if you hold that view, then you naturally are going to be a more conservative uh, feminist of the kind you are. Uh, whereas if you hold the view that men and women, that there are no kind of essential differences in this sense between men and women, um, you're going to be more likely to, to be uh, a, a feminist leaning left. And I want to question that. I mean, one, one, one reflection, I, I mean, consistent with that is a conversation I recently had that I think you saw with Diana Fleischman. Yeah. She's an evolutionary psychologist believes uh, that these sex differences are real. Her feminism sounds very much like yours. But what I want to suggest is that you could take these sex differences seriously 
and still wind up uh, with a, an agenda to the left of your agenda. What I mean by that is, like, you could say, um, okay, so men are by nature these creeps, and that just shows you what we're up against, right? It's not fair. Or, or to, or to, to put a, let's take an example of, of like uh, uh, women trying to break into a traditionally all male field. Now, you know, this idea of male bonding, I don't want to act like that's some kind of like uh, a fundamental idea in evolutionary psychology or that all evolutionary psychologists subscribe to it. There are at all. It's really not, it's really not even in, you know, it, it's not talked about much, but there are people who think that by virtue of these uh, sex differences, men do a particular kind of bonding among themselves that's very strong. And, and let's just let's just stipulate that that's the case. Could it? Because it could be the case. It could be an example of a sex difference. Well, I can imagine women saying, "So that's what we're up against when we right. try to uh, uh, get into investment banking." You know, don't act like giving us a job interview and letting us into the firm even is going to do it. We have this like this network of like male bonding to try to break into and they're not going to let us in into it uh, because whether they realize it or not, they are viewing women differently. They're viewing women as sex objects or at least as romance objects and, 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 and so on. So I'm just saying that in principle, you could take, uh, so, so, you, uh, well, to, to carry it out a little, so you could say we need remedial legislation. We need to mandate uh, you know, whether it's uh, equal equality of outcome or it's specific remedial measures. My point is, you could argue that uh, aggressive legislation is required precisely because uh, sex differences pose certain kinds of obstacles to women that are not fair, right? You could make that argument. Yes, you could. And uh, in some cases, I would. But here's the thing. Uh I think that if you want to make social progress, you I think it, it's helpful to understand the facts and have a good, you know, just knowledge of what's actually going on. And this is a big problem because take something like uh, all right, women in the workplace. Women, uh, when the second wave of feminism that I talked about earlier, when barriers came down, Women started showing up in places, in droves. All you know, they're they like veterinary medicine. It used to be kind of a, a dom, male-dominated position, and, that, and now it's female-dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, psychology is uh, female-dominated now. Biology. There were, were. I think it was the uh, feminist uh, uh, playwright and politician Claire Booth Luce who mm. once said, uh, she, she said, Mother Nature's a hard lady to fool. Uh, given the freedoms where women want to go, they're going to go and you can't stop them. Where they don't want to go, well, you know, you can't force them. So I look around to society and I see, boy, there are a lot of places women wanted to go. There are some exceptions. Uh, in, in, in One would be in physics, uh, the math-based uh, mm -hmm. and, and physical sciences, computer science, uh, engineering. You, you find, you know, far more women in psychology, relatively few in engineering. Now, you'll say, well, that's because of, uh, they don't have role models. They didn't, they didn't need role models in, you know, in, it didn't take that many role models in veterinary medicine or law or, so that can't be, well, it's sexism. Well, there were sexists in other fields and it, it didn't stop women. So then I, I just am open to the possibility that there could be another explanation besides the lack of role models or male bonding, because I imagine there were male bonding and all of that was a problem in all the fields where women, women are flourishing. And then when I look at, talk about male and female differences, uh, there it, it turns out it doesn't appear to be the case that, you know, men and women are psychologically interchangeable. We have slightly different cognitive profiles and as you said before with all of the uh you know concessions to the many exceptions but there does seem to be you know uh, in the pool of people who are interested in working with others and in the sort of caring and nurturing fields or uh, you, you find disproportionate numbers of women 
and in what my friend Camille Paglia calls the people-free zones, you know, or, you know, just a, a field where there's not, it's not a helping profession, let's say, you know, even though it does help people indirectly, but computer science or engineering, you find more men. That could be a preference uh, that it's just somewhat different on average between men and women. And, it, it, and that's not to say we shouldn't do all we can to try to make it more interesting to young women. I'm in favor of those policies. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I think it might be less than helpful to assume that it's all sexism. And there is a tendency among gender feminists, and, and this this keeps their theories in, in Attack, they when they look at disparities that they think favor men in any way, they they attribute automatically the disparity to discrimination. Now they don't look at disparities that favor women, and then you know, that's just you know when when there are more women in college, that's fine. You don't you don't hear a lot of concern about that, or you know the fatality gap or the incarceration gap or the, you know who serves in the armed forces sort of thing. You don't hear that much of a complaint there about uh, you know that males carry a heavier burden so i think what i'm a what i'm asking is to have a uh, maybe a gender e a gender equity movement and certainly gender studies mm -hmm. that can consider it, you know can look at things outside of this kind of increasingly rigid ideology uh, based on th this war on women narrative there just isn't a war on women there are individual men there are Troglodytes, there, you know, human life is, is full of danger, but it's not systemic. I, it takes something like the wage gap. You, we well, never I mean, I guess I'm, I guess I'm, I, 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 one thing I'm asking is couldn't uh, people use uh, some ideas about uh, differences in sexual psychology between men and women to um, hold women back? Well, well, no, no, no. Yes. no. I, mean, I mean, couldn't they use that idea to argue that actually, in some sense, it is systemic? I mean, let's look at the Me Too movement, okay? It's like, okay, we've seen some particularly egregious uh, behavior revealed as part of the Me Too movement. Um, Harvey Weinstein and, and so on. Um, but you could argue uh, from a point of evolutionary psychology that, you know, look, it's going to be pretty deep seated in heterosexual men that they look at women, especially if the women strike them as attractive, uh, first and foremost as something other than colleagues, and their mind immediately sets about figuring out how this could, you know, their relationship could culminate in sex and so on. In other words, you could say that if you believed that what, uh, you know, that, that, that Charlie Rose, Harvey Weinstein, and those are, those are different cases, by the way, in terms of degree of egregiousness, I think. And, and there, are, there are a whole range of gradations. Right. Well, you talk about that, that, but, and that's but, important. You could, you could make the argument that, like, this is just male psychology. If you give a male a certain kind of power and give them a certain kind of positive reinforcement for trying to abuse that power, the way men are inclined to do it. I mean, I don't want to paint an overly dark picture of male psychology. I'm just making the in principle argument that a person could use uh, some notions of deep seated sex differences to argue that, well, maybe systemic isn't such a, you know, that, that, that it's going to be a more stubborn and pervasive force that requires more forceful action to overcome then you might think if you thought all this, the apparent differences between men and women are superficial and they will, you know, the, a, a, and ephemeral. So, so you could, for example, you could, using this line of argument, you could say, you know, it's not fair that we've changed the rules maybe and some men who are doing things that used to be accepted are suddenly losing their jobs, but got to fight fire with fire. Now that we understand what a deep-seated problem this is, you know, by nature, by the nature of men, I'm just saying you could make the argument that yes, it is systemic. We do need to we do need strong measures to fight it and so on. I, I'm just I'm not I'm not siding with anybody here uh, ideologically. I, I I, I'm just making the point that I don't think. I guess one thing I'm saying is I don't think feminists on the left need to fear the idea of innate sex differences. As much as they think. Now, now, now. on the other hand, there are uses such as the ones you put them to 
where you say, look, if it turns out that there are innate differences in aspiration, what kinds of vocations you aspire to, then it will be unrealistic to think that uh, inequality of outcome always reflects discrimination. I think that that, that that is an argument they should worry about. Okay, but I'm saying that th- th- this is, you know, uh, if they want to hang on to the idea that inequality of outcome always reflects discrimination. But um, uh, do you take my point that... Yeah, um, yeah but I, I, let me tell you what, I, what I, that you're saying, what I make of that. I think that there is definitely very uh, robust evidence that uh, men approach sexuality uh, with less, you know, they're less discriminate and, and, you know, sort of more uh, eager Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's largely, you know, it's men who go to prostitutes, men, you know, who are, you know, usually guilty of uh, going too far and so forth. So we, we see that very strong tendency. Now, most societies are, uh, humane societies put a lot of emphasis in t- teaching young men to be gentlemen, and it wasn't always the. It, it, I think what happened, particularly with the sexual harassment cases, we kind of had a collision, where the you had the, at the uh, sort of mores of the sexual revolution, and I lived through this. I mean, I was there, and where there was a period where. Liberation and many feminists were saying women are just like men, you know, we're just, you know, and free love and so forth. And there was a, a breakdown of uh, sort of decorum between men and women. And it, 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 so you had the hookup culture, and some people were saying, well, what, what, what had, you know, conservatives had condemned as the hookup culture, uh, liberals are condemning as the rape culture. And it was really women not liking the hookup culture. Now, I have some problems with that because I think there were some women that liked it and are, can be just as wild as men. But overall, we needed a correction. We needed to bring the workplace up to 21st century standards because there was too much of that. It just inappropriate acting out of, I don't know, some philosophy from the uh, 70s and early 80s that just w- wasn't working. There was just too much... Uh, sexualization, and and it was harmful to women. But the Me Too movement, a a lot of men agree with this. Uh, Almost all the men I know were horrified by stories about Weinstein and, and, you know, the one after the other, these men once come out just now about the actor, uh, I think it's Australian, uh, Jeffrey Rush, and it's horrible what these young women went through with this actor... And, but I think it's something men and women do together. And, and I do see a lot of cooperation. I've seen a lot of polls that show that men are, are open to the, the idea of having higher standards in the workplace. But what you find is that the radical theorists come in and now they're in journalism. And as I told you, I think that this, these, this philosophy has permeated er, other areas of philosophy. And they're very angry at all men. They want to implicate the average guy, who, who might be a very nice guy, who would never treat a woman that way. They want to imply that he's part of the problem. All men, toxic masculinity. And I don't see it that way. Yeah, I, see I, it. I, I guess I'm suggesting that maybe masculinity is toxic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, femininity can be toxic, too. I well, agree well, no, with, I, I, uh, with, yeah, yeah. With Margaret, Margaret, Atwood, Margaret Atwood, author of The Handmaid's Tale, she said, well, maybe I'm at risk of being a bad feminist, but I do not, I think women are as capable as men as be, of being cruel and diabolical oh, you know, sh- in oh, different sure. ways. In, in different ways, yeah. And, and, but I think the, the majority of people of goodwill do not like the idea of sexual harassment, do not like what they, we saw going on in Hollywood and in, in, in various workplaces, and we do it together, but then... You know, someone like, uh, who was it? I think it was, uh, uh, not, not Brad Pitt, but uh, Matt Damon, <laughs> was on television in, in an interview, and he was strongly supporting the idea of the Me Too movement. And, but he said, as I have said and others, that we have to be careful um, about, you know, different categories of criminality. You know, some of it is criminal predation, mm-hmm. and some of it is just bad manners and bad form. There's a difference between a Harvey Weinstein and a 
Al Franken. And um, he was just in so much trouble and almost had to recant. And some people say, well, oh, who, we don't feel sorry for so poor Matt Damon. No, it's, I'm not, it's not that I feel sorry for Matt Damon that he had to do that. What that shows is just here was a nice guy saying something very supportive to the Me Too movement, but he was still called out by, I think, a small group of women who are rather uh, vocal around this issue. Well, well right. And, 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 and I mean, I would, I would encourage you to reflect on that. I mean, I mean, there's a tendency for all of us uh, in the age of social media to mistake the views of a small but vocal minority for the views of a much larger number of people. So, so I'm kind of wondering if, in a way, I'm. Oh, oops! Oh, we lost you again. Oh, there you are. Um, no, it's all right. Uh, it's so, so I guess I mean I'm wonder. I, I, I'm wondering if uh, the the um, and this is unfortunate in terms of the whole kind of psychology of tribalism because it it, it just like we all mistake. You know, we all take the most extreme voices on the other side of whatever tribal divide it is as being more representative than they often are. But I guess I, I'm. Uh, I'm just saying that that uh, maybe, let, let, maybe let, you stop, overestimate stop. the dominance of the of the worldview that you decry. I just I, I was thinking about that today because you you said something like that yesterday uh, that maybe it's just a small group of people. I'm worried about these theories. I think ideas have consequences. You don't have that many. I mean, you have like crazy right wingers, but they're not in the academy. Uh, spinning theories and, you know, sending, you know, some of the brightest kids in the country out to work at, you know, the New York Times and Silicon Valley. That's coming out of our elite universities. And these, there are a lot of young people that don't have that much. And I, this goes back to what I was saying about classical feminism is rooted in the, you know, democratic liberal tradition, which believes in due process and and free expression. And, you have uh, now, you've had on the campus in the past few years a lack of due process, uh, these kind of kangaroo courts where young men are guilty because accused, and they're now accumulating court cases where the judges are looking at what these young men went through. There was one judge in Massachusetts that said he thought he was reading something out of the Salem witch trials. These these cases are frightening, and we're, so there we go oh, too yeah. far if we allow the, the ideas that are dismissive of due process. Well, and, yeah, I think it's a, and, and I think this is where a lot of the disagreement, this is, uh, e, e, you know, where it really kind of cashes out in terms of like practical issues where you would disagree f- with people to your left is like, how much evidence of guilt do you need? And that, pra- that very practical question. And it's a challenging question because, when you're talking about something like date rape, well, on the one hand, it's a very serious thing. You would like to not let it go unpunished. On the other hand, the circumstances of it often make it hard to meet the traditional threshold of guilt, at least in the criminal justice system, of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, because it's often one person's word against another's. And um, so that's a it, that's a very challenging problem. I mean, in the realm of Me Too, there's a related question of not just kind of how many sources how many women do you need to be complaining about a guy but what really constitutes super egregious misbehavior in the workplace is it saying things you know blah 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 so but 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 my main point is i think that's uh that's where that's where a lot of this matters at a practical at a practical no, it, level. It ma- i think it matters at, a, at a, a very deep moral level of the kind of society we're going to be i completely agree with you that date rape is a, a horrible crime but being presumed guilty and falsely accused is horrible too so what we need to do is uh, find a way people of goodwill coming together men and women liberals and conservatives and working something out because conservatives have daughters and wives and sisters i mean and they are women many of them you know want to do something about this as well but, we, but it doesn't work that way. What we have is a lot of it is driven in the media. We're, we're hearing accounts of, uh, you know, men now being called out for minor, mm. you know, this, there was one absurd case where a, a, a professor, if, it was about a month ago or two months ago, he was at a conference 
and he was in an elevator at an academic conference, and he just, this nice woman said, well, what floor? And he said, lingerie, please. You know, it's an old, like, dad joke from the Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think she knew it was a joke. I also think what were there, there were other men in the elevator, and they kind of laughed. And and there were, I, it was another woman. All right, I, I got to say, it was kind of a stupid thing for him to say, right? I wouldn't say Yeah, I, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't like but I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it either. But so what? You know? I, I mean, I just think, it, it, but, but now people are, act, the woman, she, she, the professor of sociology, she said that she felt re-traumatized when he wrote her a note saying, you know, hey, I was just kidding, and why are you taking it so hard? And he, I, I, what I worry about is that we're going to be over-regulating and punishing, and I, personally, I think, and I speak for many women, at least the ones that follow me on Twitter and then who, whom I follow, is I don't want to be treated like a fragile damsel that can't handle, you know, male coarseness. I, that, I call that fainting couch feminism. I became a feminist because, I, I, you know, I wanted to be equal to men. And now it seems that we're in a stage where we're like these, you know, 19th century maidens, you know, <laughs> fainting at the first hint of male vulgarity. And, you know, women can be vulgar as well. And I, I just don't think we want to get into this uh, policing of one another, and we want to get rid of the of the people that violate the law and create impossible, you know, circumstances for women in the workplace, and sometimes men, mostly women. But I'm worried that the leadership and the theories that inform harassment legislation are coming from the, um, the these radicals that I talked about before. They're they're there, and they have a, a they see it as all they see acts of sexism, harassment, or uh, you know, people that whistle at women in the street or women's magazines or, or you know, uh, I mean, they see it, they see it on a continuum yeah, but, but uh, as this, patriarchal. I mean, yeah. If I mean, first of all, it's not as if accusations all you can just accuse a male of anything and, and you win and he resigns. I mean, like that that complaint about how Aziza sorry behaved on a date was kind of laughed out of the court, so to speak. But um, the. Uh, but, but, yeah, well, that was but, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, but tell me this. But there have been, there have been other people who've, th- there was something called the shitty men in media list. Well, that's how this whole thing, that's how a lot of this started. That's how it entered journalism, is there had been this, you know, there was the Harvey Weinstein thing, but then there had been this online list of shitty men in media. Right. Which I still haven't gotten my hands on. I'd love, <laughs> I mean, I know, send, I, 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 know have a copy. <laughs> people, I know several people. Uh, who have who have uh, bit the dust, or, or uh, you know, uh, as a result of this? Uh, but these were accusations made by you know anonymous informants, and there were innocent people. Yeah, on although the list. usually, w- although usually when they became stories, they were fleshed out with on the record sourcing or reliable anonymous source and so on like you know like i i i knew leon weasel here at the new republic but once that hit the new york times there were names attached and there was you know and 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 uh although yeah you're right the the original i assume he was originally on the shitty men media list um and i and and that was probably anonymous you're right but but uh and there is and, and, and a lot of leftists or came out against such list, uh, particularly o- older <laughs> people in their 50s, who could remember blacklists being called communists. And yeah. you could say, well, a lot of them maybe were communists. or you yeah. know, But it's a frightening idea. No, there have definitely been cases where I said, you know, um, either I don't think the sourcing is strong enough or whatever. I mean, um, uh, but... Uh, let me ask you this, though. If how do you account for I mean, this isn't just women. And you said, like, well, we prevailed everywhere but the academy. Well, apparently not. I mean, one source of, you, you know, this 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 uh, a lot of this begins with the story that um, Jody Cantor, whom I whom I know a little at The New York Times did about Harvey uh, Weinstein at the same time Ronan Farrow was working on the story. Um, there are a lot of women in media, not in academia, who are exposing this kind of thing. 
they seem to think it's serious. And I think uh, the, the wait, fact- a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. When did I, I? Of course, it's serious. I it, I wrote about the movement fairly early on in a, a long piece in the Daily News, which I I thought this is a reckoning. It's an occasion for men and women okay. to rewrite the sexual, okay. you know, social contract. It's very important, and I do, it, it, and because it's important, I think we have to do it right. And I think we have to have it something that men and women do together. It should not become an occasion to attack all men for the crimes of a few. Because I don't think the average man is a predator. It's it, it, and there there are no. so many good men, and but I see that I've seen this going on on the campus for years. There the what happens is this theory of toxic masculinity fails to make a critical distinction. There there are toxic there is such a thing there are there is pathological masculinity mm-hmm. and ma- pathologically masculine or i don't know you could call it uh, uh yeah toxic they, they such men prey on women rather than support them and, and help them and love them they destroy rather than than build but that's not the men that i've known or most of the men in in the united states they are not toxic. They're not predators. But we have to have very clear rules and very clear laws and customs to keep to protect people, especially women, as much as we can from the uh, those miscreants. Mm-hmm. But it's but to suggest that it's as you you did. You say, well, maybe um, what we learn from evolutionary psychology. What we learn from evolutionary psychology is is there does appear and men do appear to be more open to, uh, you know, c- casual sex and, you know, although that's debated sometimes. Well, but. I think, I think, I think there are more things than that about sex differences in evolutionary psychology. I think, um, man, for example, the nature of jealousy is different, uh, according to both theory and a certain amount of evidence. Yeah. And, and, uh, males are more inclined to try to control the sexuality of women uh and that is a complaint about them and i can understand why it is and my main point is just the but, I'm, not, but I'm, also, not, I'm, not, I'm not i want to be clear i'm not getting in on either side of this argument i'm trying to I make understand. the analytical point that people who are concerned about men trying to control the sexuality of women and want to do something about it i don't think in terms of what they want to do about it they need to fear the claim that it's kind of uh more in the nature of men to do this than women they can say, yeah, that's why we need to fight it. It's a strong, it's a, it's a well-entrenched, deeply rooted problem we're fighting. It is clearly a problem because no one should be able to, you know, and so on. I, th- I'm just making that, that. I agree with that, but I, but I would just add that I think women are also interested in controlling the sexuality of other women. It's complicated. Well, and sometimes of men, that happens too. I don't want to oversimplify, but, but anyway, sure. And men of other men, they they want their rivals to be sexually frustrated for their whole lives, right? Men do. Yeah. So, uh, well, some do. I don't know. It. The, the the thing is, it should. We just want to have, particularly in the academy, particularly in departments entrusted, you know, it, with the, with, you know, giving us the facts and and the latest theories about about sex and gender. We want it to be. Uh, a place where you get a, you have a diversity of ideas, where the ideas are, are tested against skeptics. We do not have that right now, and I think it's a bigger problem than you acknowledge. I think it's feeding a lot of the intolerance, and, and you know maybe even a sex panic, <laughs> uh, where you know suddenly people are um, you know accusing people, and you know they're just an environment of uh, mm-hmm. people are fearful of one another. We don't want that. No, we don't want that. Uh, and and men and women should be able to joke with each other, and and that and just and, and flirt. Yeah, yeah. Although I do understand why women, if they are in a workplace and a male superior starts joking in a certain way, they feel it's like, bad manners. It's very bad. Well, form. okay, exactly. So that's the kind of joking we should discourage if it's bad. Manners. No, I wasn't talking about that. But I, I was just saying, just a. a I, w- I just would not, I, go, I look back at the professors I had in grad school, to, and there was a, a camaraderie, and, you know, there were people that were, I would have considered sexist and predators, and 
um, not in my department, but in the graduate school, people sort of who knew who they were, but they were very much the exception. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was the norm was friends. You had friends. You were you were like colleagues. Well, I, and now I think there yeah. are still I think there are still friends. I, I don't think the the well is quite as poor. no. But like at the University of Colorado, the department was investigated for. I don't know, charges of what exactly. It, it seemed very misguided to me, but it was comp. Mm. And they found out, oh, they were having parties with graduate students and there was alcohol served. And suddenly it was like graduate students are now like the brownies or the Girl Scouts, you know, and going with these older people. And it's it's ridiculous. You have to, I mean, root out the predators. And, and I'm, I'm, for one, happy now that even though it went too far, the message has gone out, and even the sort of clueless men that you know, they've got the message that this is not going to be tolerated. But we have to be very careful about false accusations and about enlarging the meaning of harassment to include just casual exchanges, and that could be handled by just telling someone to back off or you know, in a, in a human way. Not everything has to be yeah, yeah, litigated. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I do think different people are different, and and, and I think, uh, you know, you're probably uh, a strong, assertive, forceful person, and you don't have trouble uh, discouraging this kind of thing in an unambiguous way. I think uh, some women have more trouble, are less inclined to be confrontational, and for them, it's a bigger problem. And maybe we should just teach them to be tougher. But at the same time, I think that's part of the source of disagreements uh, among women uh, on how how exactly but women that's with. exactly right women disagree on this i think it was uh the feminist it's pretty hardline marxist feminist maybe uh carol vance but she was the pro-sex feminist and she once argued that about some research she'd seen about a third of people really like you know sort of um r- raucous r- you know uh um sex humor about sexuality men and women about mm-hmm. a third don't really care and a third are just offended and i think what's happened is maybe the for a long time maybe because of the sexual revolution or same thing going on in the culture the people who liked raunchy humor were getting their way and a lot of people were very offended so now it's changing and so the people who are very offended are getting their way so we'll have a different kind of society for a while until it Flips again. So it's well, not- I, I, I do think it's, there's a dialectic playing out, and and that yeah. maybe we've reached one extreme, and the pendulum's going to start swinging back. But um, the uh, so so you said, I mean, we're we're, we're approaching record uh, territory <laughs> in terms of how long this conversation will have been. You said you had some second thoughts about things you wanted to say. I have one, just that I did go actually uh, research. I, I had characterized what Ben Shapiro, whether he did or didn't apologize. I actually looked into that, so I want to say something about that. But but um but first, uh what what would you what devastating rejoinder Oh no no I didn't <laughs> I didn't I didn't have that. I just thought um that when we were talking about you and and Tamler Summers, my stepson, we have this argument. By the way, can I just quickly ask you a question? I just realized so he's got your last name. I mean, you know, I think I had, I had in some distant past, uh, I ha- had become aware that he was your son-in-law. I'm not sure. But so he's got your last name. He's my he's my son. I mean, my stepson. Oh. He's been with me since he was oh, four he's your years step-son. old. He's your stepson. Yeah. Okay. I thought you said he was your son-in-law. Okay. So he's your stepson. Okay. So that is, yeah. um, well, that's a close connection. You know him well. <laughs> Okay. I know him very well, and he uh, probably would be. We, we have this argument; it goes nowhere. He will not admit that things I'm combating are are serious, and he thinks, "Oh, it's just you know some silly students at at Swarthmore small group." And well, he is on a campus. He's got you know he, he he's at right. the university. He's at Houston. Houston. That's a place it's not happening. It's not happening. It's, right. And, and it, it, I think that it may be that, that sort of school will be the last place <laughs> in Houston. Uh, I mean, it, it, you tend to see these phenomena at um, the, m- the more expensive private liberal arts colleges and, and, and the uh, elite universities. It's, it's huge at Stanford. It's huge at Harvard. They don't hear the other point of view. They are given 
a fairly paranoid theory about women's position in society. And, and that would be fine. You know, in my ideal philosophy department, I'd ha- certainly have a Catherine McKinnon or some, she's, she's fascinating. And I think fascinatingly wrong, but then I want someone there who gives the counterpoise. And increasingly we do not have, you know, diversity of ideas in our, in our colleges. And we're going to pay a higher, higher price. And Tamler thinks that I overreact when I hear, you know, about a, a, you know, a kangaroo court on a college, or I overreact when I hear about an act of censorship. These are basic values, and that I'm, I worry that people are not sufficiently protective. They don't know the history of how the our, our system of our legal system, how it evolved out of British common law and where due process came from. What is it like not to have it? What are the ramp- uh, What is it like to have censorship? Who does the censoring? We don't have a ministry of truth. We have a, a robust tradition of free exchange of ideas that it's, it, these are foundational. And when I, so maybe I do overreact when I hear about these cases, but I'm worried that we're seeing an erosion of fundamental principles you and Tamler just take for granted because uh, you're not maybe you're not paying attention or maybe you're both I, right. I, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm, I mean, my daughters just gra- both graduated from college within the last uh, few years. So I'm, I'm 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 at least somewhat conversant in the in the situation. But but I, I'm also prepared to to be proved wrong that I'm I'm uh, it's not a real problem. And just let it go. Like today or it was last night, I was looking at a newspaper and it said that in a it was voted in a district in England that the ki- the, the the kids, this are I don't know, sixth and seventh graders, were going to learn that boys have periods too, right? Because that was supposed to be uh, progressive. And I was sort of upset. Wait, 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 wait. It was yeah. it was actually taught in the schools or what? They're teaching it in the schools. That uh, boys. Yes, because a girl. Because the the idea now is that who's a man and who's a woman, it's not determined by, the tip, you know, conventional uh, standards. It's sort of who you decide you are and mm-hmm. you, they are a boy or they are a girl. And now the, we, we've all got used to accepting that you're not necessarily, your, your sex and gender right. don't match right. up necessarily. But now we, it seems to be, that, no, they want to say even sex. It's on a continuum. There's really no such thing. And boys can have periods too. And I and then my friend said, "Oh, just let it go. You know, don't get upset." And uh, okay, but you know, I even if I'm not upset, but I think it should be debated. You, you seem a little. You seem a <laughs> it's because little it's upset. crazy. It seems crazy, and involving kids at this point when we it, we really haven't had a full intellectual discussion with uh, contrib- contributions from scientists. And I say this is someone who. Would if a, I met a trans person, a, 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 a transgender person, I would be respectful. And one of the people I admire greatly is uh, the economist Deirdre McCloskey. Uh, Deirdre McCloskey. I adore her, and she's been coming to AEI for years, and long before the trans issue was uh, really uh, on the boards. Right. You know, conservatives and, and conservative and libertarian economists were just you know it took them about a minute to um, accommodate to, to Deirdre. And um, so I, it's, you know, it's unthinkable to me that t- someone would be rude to her and, and cruel to her. I don't want that. But if we're, what's happening now is there does appear to be a lot of very young people who suddenly are declaring themselves trans. And what do we do about that? And, and, you know, it, it should be discussed and you shouldn't face uh, Twitter mobs and, so forth, and and some philosophers, some scholars, if they dare to say anything, um, they're targeted. And I don't think liberals are doing, and I say that because conservatives can't do anything about this, but I think it's liberals who have to stand up and um, say, look, we need to, you know, you can't just shut down the discussion. Yeah, I think Twitter mobs are a, uh, I think that that phenomenon is getting more attention. Like, for example, I hadn't heard the term call out cultural culture until fairly recently you know refers to this idea of calling someone out like the whole mob decides that you're the bad person we're calling you out 
And just the fact that there is now a label for that that is not always used critically. Actually, I think most people who use the term color culture are using it critically, are skeptical of the value of that uh, <clears throat> dynamic, at least of its being as pervasive as it is. So I think, um, you know, I'm kind of hopeful that uh, social media could become slightly less unple- unpleasant places. But why would it be if these ideas are being taught more and more confidently to every freshman class in, you know, at Northwestern and at Harvard, and they have microaggression bias alert teams, and the whole idea of a microaggression. Well, uh, look, a counter a counter infrastructure is developing. You mentioned the Heterodox Academy. There is the intellectual dark web, which I'm going to get back to in a moment. <laughs> oh, um, oh, the, the, the uh, no, uh, but but um, you know, I mean, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, like a lot of people. I, I, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope you're right, and you and Tamla are right, uh, because it's uh, distressing for me to see. And, and here's the thing: you could think, well, maybe. You know, and I think to myself, maybe this is just what it's like to get old. I, I was like a Vietnam protester in, in um, uh, high school and college, and it used to upset my uncle Clifford, and I just thought he was like this clueless older guy. And now I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm Uncle Clifford now because yeah. I see this. The, the reason that I doubt that, I, I mean, I don't believe that is because I see a lot of this furor and this anger and this, this social justice activism coming from uh, ideas that were never really examined. They come mm. from, a, and it, it's not like an authentic, youthful revolution. It's been, you know, sort of curated in, are in these academic departments yeah, where, but they this, did, where they didn't allow criticism. But this is something I wonder about. I mean, I sometimes do, you know, on some issues, my daughters are to my left. This may be hard for you to believe, but it's true. And, and, and you know, when I argue with them, I, I, I find myself thinking, you know, they just won't listen to reason. And then I remember, wait, that's what my dad said about me. And I, and I genuinely wonder how much of this, that, you know, we hear these complaints Kids, you know, John Haidt talks about, you know, kids in college, they no longer know how to reason because they never they, they, they evade, you know, the, the the ideological opponent rather than confronting them and so on. But I genuinely wonder how much of it is just the time honored confidence of youth, right? The the I, the self-certainty and passion of youth, which uh, I assume I possessed in considerable measure. Um, I, I genuinely don't know the answer. I, I, I really and don't. I don't either, because I don't even know how many of the youth or the iGens, Gen Z, as they're called, I don't know how many of them even agree with this. I'm thinking there is a silent majority of young people who are not happy with what's going on, and maybe they'll find their voice and see the the, the need for... I mean, that's what... And, and again, not to defend the intellectual dark web, but some of us do get a large audience because they're just so... They're just so grateful to mm. hear the other side. No, I, some, I, I, some, I, I, yeah. I, I think that's true. I, I mean, I think it's interesting. Whenever um, there's a speech code that prevents a lot of people from saying, that prevents people from saying something that a lot of people really think is true, I think it, it opens right. the field for the, the pioneers to become dominant. It's like Jordan Peterson Look, he's a perfectly interesting guy, uh, you know, but I, I do think if you ask, why is he, you know, and he has these interesting provocative ideas, but there are a lot of people with interesting provocative ideas. He's very uh, skilled orator. I, I don't want to minimize any of that, but I think when you ask, how has he achieved the, you know, these proportions as this like major intellectual, when I'm sure there are people all over colleges going, you call this guy an intellectual, right? You know? I think part of the answer is there was this opening available uh, for him to say these things that a lot of people agreed with that um, not many people were saying. And, and, and uh, I think that's a certain amount of what uh, gives the intellectual dark web energy and prominence, which gets us back to the fact that I wish they'd quit complaining about how little prominence they have. Maybe they have quit. They don't complain about that. <laughs> well, well, that original piece by Barry Weiss made it made them seem like this marginal. Yeah, you, you, you have these, around. these fixed ideas about that one piece by Barry Weiss and that one tweet by 
by Ben Shapiro, which you're going to get back to. Perfect transition, Christina. <laughs> Uh, no, I wanted to check up because I characterized it in a certain way. I said the guy did not apologize. So I thought, and I also, I was, I was uh, quoting the tweet from memory. So here's the actual tweet. Oh, Israelis okay. like to build. Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. This is not a difficult issue. And then hashtag settlements rock. That's in 2010. Um, so he did... Um, he did do a thing. Uh, he wrote a thing uh, months ago that was called stupid slash immoral stuff I've said. And then in parentheses and retracted multiple times. I, I'm actually not sure he's uh, if he had retracted that particular. Thing. I'm also not sure what stupid slash immoral. Does that mean everything he's going to list was both stupid and immoral or just one or the other? So he hasn't, <laughs> you know, he's not quite saying unequivocally and unambiguously that, that this one thing was immoral. Again, there were there's. There was a list of, of different uh, perceived transgressions under that rubric, stupid and moral stuff I've said. But anyway, here's what he actually said about that. He did not apologize, didn't come close. What he said was he quotes the tweet and then he says, I was clearly talking about talking about Israeli and Arab leadership as well as terror supporting people in the Arab world. How do you know that? Because I said so in the very next tweets. Then he lists some tweets that did follow this. And interestingly, he does not include the timestamp. He includes the date, but he doesn't include the timestamp, which is interesting because that normally just comes with the tweet. You kind of have to remove it. And as far as I know, if you don't want it there anyway, it's not there. And interestingly, although he says, I said so in the very next tweets, those very next tweets did not come for more than an hour. And they came after he got a ton of blowback. So for, for him to, and we'll get to what the tweets are, they're actually, I'm not sure how exonerating they are. One of them is uh, <clears throat> uh, apologies to Matt Duss, who is now Bernie Sanders foreign policy advisor. Apologies, you're correct, read the slur about Arabs. Not all Arabs like open sewage and blowing things up. Just pals, meaning Palestinians, it's capitalized, just pals and their allies. So that that was that was after he'd given it a lot of thought. Now, he also said things like there are many, many Christians and Muslim Arabs who are wonderful people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the post, re I wrote about Arabs who take part in the Israeli Arab conflict. Is anyone who so I didn't even see him quite saying he was just talking about leaders. But in any my main point is he acts as if he said so in the he says, I said so in the very next tweet. So if you just read the damn thing in context, you know. That is extremely disingenuous. This tweet was wait, a wait, 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 wait. Yeah, standalone tweet. It was a standalone tweet. And, and yeah. he only started qualifying it to the extent that he did after for more than an hour getting a ton of blowback. OK, well, he's, he, 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 I, look, I'm just not willing to convict someone on the basis of a tweet from eight years ago that he's obviously embarrassed by willing to I call immoral and and or stupid and I, I know him and he's just a, a, you know overall seems to me he's much too conservative for me I don't agree with him on a number of issues but he's a a person uh, who's seems to me to be just a, a good guy with conservative ideas so you found this one tweet but there's so much else that he's done. As yeah, but I've come on, I mean, this one tweet. Come on, Christina. I mean, seriously. He was a, a, a one that tweet. That is so egregious. It, that it is, is so great. But maybe he was in a, maybe something had happened. There had been a bombing. He was angry. He was, I don't know. Well, so uh, we but, could, but remember, this is someone who had chosen to be at Breitbart during a period when it was a flagrantly fear-mongering Islamophobic site. And then he this grew does not, up. This is not... He, this is not in isolation in that sense. But what about the fact that he grew up, left the place when, uh, what was his name? Uh, Lewinos uh, uh, Corey Lewin Lewandowski. Yeah. Lewandowski behaved so egregiously with this young woman right. and uh, uh, Michelle Fields. In the, and and he, he was suddenly mortified and horrified by the whole ambiance and atmosphere at Breitbart. He left it became a very, very staunch anti-Trumper. And just I just think he's grown up. And 
Well, we don't know. My main point, anyway, my main point isn't to convict him on the basis of something he said at one point, uh, egregious though it is. The, the, so the, uh, how do you feel about uh, the young woman that was hired by the New York Times that had not just one, but like a, an insane amount of tweets, uh, you know, wishing white people to be dead and 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 saying things. Uh, I'm forgetting her name. Um what happened? She, she got she, fired in the end? No, no, no. She was hired by the New York Times, and then people found just this vast numbers of tweets that uh, attacking white people, white men, white women. You know, just she she's Asian, and she is. I think it's, her name is uh, Sarah Jong, and she was attacking, and oh. they were oh, and they were. And it wasn't one. It wasn't two. It, it now. But, didn't, but didn't did the New York Times ultimately let her go or what? No, no, no. She's there. <clears throat> She's there. And you know, a friend of mine published an article because he looked at her other writings, yeah. which were very good on tech, and didn't you didn't see this? And I just thought, okay, you know, I, I was kind of thinking that was a case where some of it she was claiming some of it was sarcastic and maybe arguably so. But I want to be clear. ironic. What, what I'm yeah. not, um, yeah, ironic. What I'm not. Um, <clears throat> the context in which this arose during yesterday's conversation with you, the first half of this long conversation, um, was just, I was just saying that, like, you know, when Ben Shapiro did this, um, Eric Weinstein came out in support of it and said, look, Ben has done his reckoning, so to speak, not in so many words, but he did it. Uh, and as I said, when I brought this up with Brett Weinstein, he said, I don't know the details, but I think if you look at the context, my, my, my point is just that, um, and maybe this is no one's claiming otherwise, but I, I think some people are. My point is just that, um, you know, the IDW is a tribe with, I think, a certain kind of ideological character. The intellectual dark web, they look out for their own. And my, my main point is just that if this had been some social justice warrior who tweeted something egregious, it obviously wouldn't have been this exact same thing, and then purported to make... Uh, uh, do a reckoning with it, where on close inspection they'd been incredibly disingenuous and done nothing like it, much less apologized. Um, I don't think people in the IDW would be so un as uncritical as they were with Ben Shapiro. So I'm just saying, uh, you know, and, and and that's fine. I, 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 you know, do you remember the case of uh, Avital Ronell as a professor at NYU, and it came out that she had been. Apparently, she was accused of sexually harassing this young man for years, and it was it was investigated. And during the investigation, at some point, uh, a large number of well-known sort of feminist scholars and uh, literary, you know, cultural studies professors, famous many of them feminists, came out in her defense and said that she was a prominent, important person, and you know, almost suggesting that how could this this you know, it implied that he was a liar and it was it was in the language of um you know kind of being apologists for mm. this powerful person i completely agree that and i recognize that it was they like avital and, and it, she was their friend and it's natural to you know when you know someone we do that we do that and i we mm. were saying this off the air when you know someone you, you, you see them in their totality. And so and, and that's one of the dangerous things about Twitter is because people can judge you in your entire life and being based on, you know, a, a very horrible thing that you wrote. And a lot of people ha are in trouble for that. So I understand that from both sides. I mean, I think it's bad that we judge people on one tweet. Maybe everybody should be allowed to... Um, mess up on Twitter. Or maybe we should yeah. all send out something horrible and then we're exonerated and we move on. I don't know, because I don't like this. Well, and, and I think, There's something dehumanizing about it. Yeah. And I think the speech code rules should be closer to um, uh, symmetrical with different ethnicities. I mean, again, I think I think if he had said this about Jews or African-Americans, I think he'd be in, in more trouble just because I don't think Arabs have the institutional support uh, the way there is the institutional opposition to anti-Semitism or racism of other kinds, you know. I agree with that. That's a good point. And I think the same thing is true of boys and young men. I think a lot of, I think there's, maybe as Diana Flashman said, we're already wired to be more protective of women than men. Men can be more 
just expendable people have less sympathy. And uh, there, there's this uh, structural asymmetry where you have vast numbers of organizations looking out for the interests of women and relatively few effective organizations who are looking out for, you know, the, the you know, well-being of young men in our schools, in our colleges, in the workplace. And no, there's no one there to defend them. So I'm agreeing with you on the deeper point. About- uh, yeah, no, institutional infrastructure matters. Um, and, uh, but I think when we post this, you will see there's two comment sections. There's the bloggingheads.tv site, and then there's the YouTube, Blogging Heads YouTube channel. I think you'll see, particularly on the Blogging Heads YouTube channel, that you have a lot of support. This is what I predict. Well... That I think maybe because um, maybe I don't know. I'm not going to say that because I think I could be right, but I'm willing to be persuaded. <laughs> I'm willing to that be persuaded that I'm wrong. My explanation, but uh, but maybe 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 I'm wrong. Who knows? Anyway, I knew I I knew I would I would enjoy talking with you. And, Same here. Um, and we don't I'm we sorry. don't disagree. We don't disagree about everything. I think by any means, but. Uh, where we do, I graciously uh, concede that I am wrong and you're right, being the, uh, <laughs> the Victorian gentleman that I am. Uh, and being a, not a fainting couch feminist, but a woman of uh, contemporary society, I accept your, uh, <laughs> my your pro- benevolent my sexism. Of, <laughs> my profession of inferiority. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Christina. Thanks for coming back and doing this. Uh, oh, wait, can th- I just try? Can I try one thing? Just to, it if it's showing us your dog, I would like to see your dog, which we it's never got. It's going to be that. And okay. Maybe. Oh, I don't want to. Well, all right. I'll turn this around. Do you see her? Not yet. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a. Oh, well, I'll Not exactly a zoom. Now, is that one of these hybrid dogs or what? Uh, what's the breed? Multi poo. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Multi poo. Perfect example of a hybrid. You know, it looks so a she's, little. She's, she's gender non conforming. She looks a little like our Bichon. We have a, a oh, what have seems a to well, we have what seems to be a Bichon Frise. We got him from a shelter. I'm pretty. He's either mainly or entirely, and uh, some some resemblance, including the brown things uh, that come down from the eyes. Well, I, yeah, she has. Uh, I have to do something about that. I, I do that too, but I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just natural for them. You, you, you don't. Uh, I have. Uh, there's eye makeup you can get them to put. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, I actually find. I mean, I, I I suspect at this point everyone has quit listening, but I actually find myself without thinking about it, uh, <clears throat> getting rid of doing that uh, fiddling with Frasers and kind of like uh, cleaning up for him since he can't reach. He he doesn't have. I know they're combs. The doctor told me to use. Yeah, comb. yeah. But anyway, I I want I, and I even bonded somewhat with Glenn Greenwald uh, from the Intercept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I disagree with him on a lot of issues. But uh, I don't know. We were f- fight. Oh, I know. He was saying there are no women in the introductual dark web. And and I said. And you, you said, know, I, I beg your pardon. I, I beg your pardon. And somehow I, I showed him a picture of not only me, but my little uh, female gender nonconforming multi poo. And. Glenn loves dogs. He wrote back and he said. Well, I don't agree with that, but that's a cute dog. And then he won my heart. And then it turns out that he runs uh, a He's shelter. got like a billion dogs, yeah. For dogs. In, yeah. Is it in Brazil or Argentina? Yep, Brazil. I forget. And he's doing these wonderful things. So I said I would donate to his shelter, but he can't use any of the money, you know, for his other causes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but what if, what you know, so that's what I'm saying. When you find out people are just more complicated, mm-hmm. I completely disagree with him, but... He's doing the, it's just such wonderful work, and it's so innovative. He he helps homeless people and uh, and and it provides shelter for dogs. And some of the homeless people work in the shelters. It's it's innovative. And Glenn is an amazing. He is a whirlwind of productivity. I have no idea how he does it all. Yeah. Um, but if we can cross the divide between you and Glenn Greenwald, I think America. Uh, there's hope for America. Well, I'm thinking it's animal rights. Maybe, and, maybe uh, everybody like should... factory farming. I've got a lot of friends on, you know, conservatives and liberals who are, Ooh. especially I think millennials or what is he? You're showing your dark side. Uh, who could get, could agree on that? 
uh, I, Peter Singer was once a professor of mine. Oh, really? I read, I, I read his book early on, and I was convinced, but I didn't. I just couldn't give up entirely eating meat. It's so good. But now the Israelis are perfecting <laughs> meat that tastes like meat. Yeah. They have steaks, and they've created in a laboratory, and it looked like something out of a French restaurant. It might not taste that way. but Yeah, I taught a course with Peter, and uh, it made me... Um I'm a more responsible eater than I was, although not quite as responsible as he is. Yeah. Um, so, well, anyway, cute dog. What's the dog's name again? Izzy, short for Isabella. Oh, Natch. Cute and I dog. I get another one. If anybody out there has one, I need a second dog because she needs a friend. She's just very social and it makes me play all day. And I don't have time to play. So, they <laughs> so should, she had a friend. So people should ship their dogs to you. <laughs> a little dog. A little dog. Pounds. Ship yeah. small dogs to you. Yeah, I, I want to have a dog farm. Okay. Uh, I, I encourage that. And and, <laughs> and and thank you for the conversation. Um, we'll, uh, we can do it again. I mean, assuming there's anything we've left untouched uh, in the course. If there's left untouched, you should come on. My, I have a podcast with Danielle Crittenton called oh, the, yeah, Fems, yeah, yeah. the Femsplainers. And yeah. what we try to do is she's... We just try to talk about all these issues and, and kind of bring in people, very liberal, very conservative, and without any constraints, we can just talk to them, whatever comes to our mind. Okay. I'm game. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's David Frum's work. So maybe we'll, yes. Yeah, yeah, I've met her, yeah. Yeah, um, sends her regards. Okay, well, uh, I, I'm game. I'm easy. Okay, so, so you'll have to come on the Femsplainers, and you're an excellent mansplainer, so... We welcome you. <laughs> That's my specialty. Thanks a lot, Christina. Bye-bye.